Brother David, before you start the, the, the film, well, that's fine. Keep it on. That, that's fine. I was going to get somebody to testify, but I would rather wait for another day. But I, I'm just going to testify on my own behalf. Is that okay? Yeah. Because I'm just going to be honest with you. That is exactly what I needed this morning. Yes. Thank you, Brother Jim, for agreeing. That's exactly what I needed this morning. That song, everything they did, because to be honest with you, Sister Misty, I know exactly what you're saying. This week has been one of those weeks where I felt like every time I turned around, Satan was standing at the door, ready to just come in and ransack everything I had. Amen. And I'll be honest with you, there were some days he might have won because I was ready to throw in the towel and give it up. But I realized, even before this morning, and even though I didn't feel like it, I feel better now. Amen. But even when I didn't feel so good, I knew my God is still seated on the throne. He still reigns in glory. Amen. Satan is defeated. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. And no matter how I feel, what my circumstance looks like, my God is in control. And he will make all things work together for my good. Somebody give me praise this morning. This morning, I went to prayer conference Monday and Tuesday and had a great time, so I'm ready to preach. Yes. Don't say it if you don't mean it. <laughs> I want you to get your Bibles and go to Genesis chapter 16. As you know, we are in week number nine of a series about the names of God. And I don't know about you, but this series has really changed a lot in my life. It has really impacted me and affected the way that I pray, affected the way that I study the word, affected a lot that I really didn't think would be affected, all because I started to see more of God's character. As you know, we've walked through several names, and I won't, I won't belabor, but we talked about El we talked about um, Elohim, the creator God, the God who was able to create something out of nothing. He spoke and everything come into existence. Then we spoke of Jehovah, the personal God, the God who wants an intimate relationship with us and reveal himself personally. Adonai, the Lord, the owner of it all, how we should submit to his rulership. And when we submit to his rulership, he, he pours blessings out on us. We talked about Jehovah Jireh, the God who is our provider, the Lord who sees to it. The Lord who will see to our problem and to our promise. We talked about uh, El Elyon, the God who is in control of, of it all, the God who has the final say, and the God who is the source. We talked about Emmanuel, God with us. Even when we feel like we're alone, he's with us. And then we talked last week about El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough. These names have really impacted my life, and today we're going to talk about one that some of you may have heard this name before, and I think we may have discussed it one other time, but before I do that, I want to I want to just ask you a question. Have you ever felt overlooked? Have you ever felt forgot? Ever been in that state of mind where you really felt that nobody cared, nobody was concerned with you, and that if you just disappeared, it wouldn't even matter? This week when I was at prayer conference, some of you know our, our friend Kenneth and Bethany Hearn. He preached for us when we were out. And uh, he and I, Taylor wasn't able to go and his wife wasn't able to go. So we shared a room so he could come. And we just, you know, we, we went to prayer conference, had lunch, and we just got to talking. And I got to know him a little better than what I already did. And uh, one, one benefit of being a pastor, and, and I love the church of God, under, understand me when I say this. One benefit of being a pastor is once you reach a pastoral ministry like this and have a church, you become more well-known. People know you by name. They know your face. You start getting elected to boards and use all this political mess. And, but, but the thing is, is people start knowing who you are. And Taylor and I have kind of gotten to that place where we're not first generation. We're a first generation church of God, first generation pastors. We started from nothing. And now people recognize us. It's, it's good to be known. Amen. It's Amen. good to be recognized. But Kenneth, on the other hand, Kenneth is an evangelist. And while evangelism is a very important tool, and it is a very important ministry, evangelists, for whatever reason today, are not nearly as important, it seems, as they used to be. That was seen in how we would go around and people would stop and talk to me and 
I would have to introduce him. Now, granted, he has some history in the church of God. His grandparents served under some of the most prominent pastors, and he served at the state office. He, he should be more well-known than me, but there were individuals who had met him previous times who just this week said, now remind me of your name again. And he's met them. He's preached at some of their churches, some have been invited to preach or asked to preach. And we got in the car one night, and I hope you don't mind me sharing this, but oh well. But we got in the car one night, and he said, you know, sometimes I wonder why I even got credentials and why I even preach. He said, nobody knows who I am. He said, nobody has a clue. He said, and he jokingly said, everybody knows who you are. He said, you walk in, and they all, pastor, great pastor this. He said, and I tell them I'm the evangelist, and they just say, well, God bless you. And that's it. And he said, you know, I just feel like sometimes evangelism, I should just bite the bullet and pastor church, and that's not what I feel like I'm called to do. That's how he felt, because he felt so overlooked. Now, these people that overlooked him, they didn't mean it. It was nothing personal. But that's how he felt, Sister Teresa. He felt, even in the midst of his peers, in the midst of other pastors, even in the, in the companionship of somebody who's been where he is, he still felt overlooked and forgotten about, unimportant. A lot of you know what that's like. We've walked that road before, and there are many people in society today that know that feeling. During the COVID pandemic in 2020, there was a study done. And the study was to see about the impact that quarantine and social distancing was having on people. And they found in this study, Sister Myrtle, over 60% of Americans felt lonely and isolated. 40% of that 60% said they, they, they felt distance, they didn't have social connection, and they, they kind of felt overlooked. But then 20% of that took it even further and said, I feel totally forgotten by society and like nobody cares that I exist. They were isolated. They were, they were shut up in homes. And then during that time, the, sad, the biggest sad reality of the COVID quarantine and pandemic was depression and suicide rates skyrocketed. More people almost, not as much, but more people died from depression and, and suicide during the, during the quarantine than ever before because they felt lonely. They felt like nobody saw them. There's people today, and some of you are here, that you still feel that way. There are wives who feel overlooked by their husbands. There are husbands who feel overlooked by their wives. There are employers who feel unimportant and, and, and disregarded by their employers. There are, there, are spa, there are children who feel neglected and disregarded by their families and their parents. There are Boys, single boys who feel unimportant and, and unloved by other females that they desire to have a relationship with. There's single females who feel unimportant and overlooked by single males. Here's the other thing. There's even church members who feel overlooked and unimportant to their pastor in their church. But that's a double-edged sword because there's also pastors who feel overlooked and unappreciated and unimportant by their church. There are hundreds of thousands of people who feel overlooked. They feel unloved. They feel forgotten. They feel unimportant. Some individuals even feel that way about God. They've prayed and they've prayed. They've fasted. They, 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 they have sought the Lord. They have gone through every revival. They've done all that they know to do in the religious routine, and yet God has still yet to show up. They feel forgotten. They feel overlooked. Been there? All of us can attest to something. If you're there today, it's hard because it takes all that you can to get up and go to a church where you feel like you are lost in the midst of crying. It's hard to get up and go to work when you feel that way, when you feel like, why am I even coming here? All I'm doing is for is a paycheck anyway. This boss doesn't appreciate me. Why am I even doing this? It's hard to function when you feel like you don't even belong in society. When your mind and your emotions tell you you were better off dead. It's hard, but I've got good news for you. You may feel forgotten. You may feel overlooked. But God's got a name for that situation too. Every problem, every situation, God's got a name to speak to that. And today we're going to talk about that name. And I just want to go ahead and give you just a little synopsis of it. You may not feel seen, but God sees you. 
When you go to the book of Genesis, chapter 16, we read a very familiar story. Now, when we read Bible stories, we typically focus on really important characters. Uh, the main characters, as you're about to find out in this, are Abram and Sarah, or they will be known in a further, uh, in a further chapter as Abraham and Sarah. And it's easy to talk about them. Sister Judy, it's easy for me to get up and preach about Abraham and Sarah because their story relates to a lot of us. It, it's really easy because there's enough substance, Tally, to talk about Abram and Sarah. We can talk about how they're the foundations of our faith. We can talk about how they are part of the lineage of the Messiah. We can talk about how Hebrews 11 called them some of the heroes of the faith and how, how they believed that God would give them a child, how God would make them a nation of many, even though they were old and Sarah was barren, but yet that God accounted their faith unto righteousness and he answered their prayer. It's easy to talk about them because their story reminds us of God's promises and that he is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask or think. It's easy to talk about them, but then there's other individuals who we typically look over, but yet their story, their situation, their, their, their part in this whole grand scheme reveal just as much about God and his character as anybody else. Genesis chapter 16, starting with verse 1, says, Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. Say Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, See now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid, perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarah. Then Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, and Abram to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarah said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and then she saw that she had conceived. I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and you. So Abram said to Sarah, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarah dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Now, verse number 7. Now the angel of the Lord found her. Say he found her. By a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself to her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so that they, they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are with child. And you shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man, his hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all the brethren. And here it is. Then she called the name of the Lord, who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For he said, Have I also been seen him who sees me? Therefore the well she was called, Ber Laha Roi. The God who sees. Now, what you need to understand about Hagar is it's interesting that she's even mentioned in this passage. Because Hagar was not somebody who the world or anybody else would deem important. She's not listed anywhere else in scripture other than one other time, and it's not really, not really talking her up. She's only listed in two scriptures, and she's not really given a lot of clout. She's not considered a hero of faith. She is not an important character really to anybody because Hagar is a slave. Hagar is an Egyptian slave that Abram and Sarah probably bought on their, on their journey into Egypt and then she was bought to serve in the house. Verse 2 tells us that she was Sarai's handmaiden or maid, meaning that she her whole job was to meet the needs and serve the lady of the house. That was who she was. Now you would think being so close to somebody of such prominence that she'd have a little more clout and a little more importance than the others, but that's not the case. Sarah, I mean, Hagar is a slave, therefore she is serving from a place of insignificance and unimportance. To everybody else around, she's nothing but a piece of property among many others. She is a slave who has no say, no opinion, she just does what she's told. Hagar is so unimportant that in reality, if it had not been for Sarah's barrenness, she would have never made it into the scriptures. 
If Sarah had not gone through with this plan, Hagar would have never been known by us. She was unimportant. She knew what it meant to be overlooked. She knew what it meant to be used, abused, and neglected. She was so unimportant to the people that owned her, Brother Richard, that it says when that Sarah gave her to Abram. That implies, Brother Gene, she didn't even have a say in the matter. Abram, she didn't, Sarah didn't even go up to her and say, do you think Abraham's good looking? She didn't even go up to her, Kena, and say, you know, would you be willing to do this? But no, it was assumed, Tina. Because Sarah owned Hagar, Hagar was insignificant and was just a pawn in her scheme to get what she wanted and she could use her and do what she wanted to. Hagar knew what it meant to be overlooked and disregarded. She knew what it meant. So she's given, she's just, she's used as this, as, as, as this, this pawn. She's used as, as, as just this, this figure in this plan of Sarah's and she's just given over. She's pushed into a relationship with a man that owns her that she hardly even knows. And of course, as nature goes, she gets pregnant. Now you would think at this point, Sarah would be happy. She got what she wanted, her plan had worked. But as we just read, it showed that as she got pregnant, Sarah started realizing what she had done. She started realizing this child is going to be the heir of my husband's royalty and his means, and it's not going to come from me. Even though it's my surrogate child and I'm going to raise it if he's mine, this woman thinks she's somebody because she bore the child of my husband. And she's going to think that she's got some, she's got some gumption, she's got some responsibility, she's got some, some, some title that she can walk around with. So Sarah started realizing the problem, and when, as you know, when two women get at each other, I would rather see two rattlesnakes put into a bucket together than see two women go at it. Because rattlesnakes would eventually stop. I better stop there, move on, move on. <laughs> But Sarah started getting jealous. And it even says that Hagar started despising Sarah, meaning that in Hagar's mind, she was, she did think she was somebody. Now, we don't know what she did, but we do know what Sarah did. She started thinking, I'll show her. And so she goes to Abram and she says, my wrong be upon, your wrong be upon me. I'm going to take responsibility for this. But listen, she's acting like she's somebody. And I'm going to put a stop to it. I'm going to do something about this. See, Sarah had been confronted with her sin. And so she got bitter and angry and took it out on Hagar. She got bitter and angry because her plan, get this, her plan had worked. But she got mad because it worked. And so she started abusing and neglecting Hagar. It says that Abram said, she's in your hand. This is the great translation. She's in your hand. Do whatever you want to do. In verse 6, I think it says, it said that she was harsh towards her. That means she started abusing her in different ways. We don't know if it was physical, if it was mental, but a woman scorned? Hello? Hell hath no fury. Amen. So I could just see Miss Sarah. Honey, that don't look good enough. You need to do that over. Hey, God, I don't know what you think you're doing. You need to be up before all the rest of it. You need to answer it. I can just imagine Sarah made it a living hell for Hagar. She abused her. She neglected her. She treated her wrong. This slave that she used and that she decided was going to be a pawn in her plan, she started being the, she started being the, 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 the receiver of all of Sarah's bitterness and anger towards God. And finally, Hagar had enough. So she fled. Verse 7 says, verse 6 and verse 7 both say that she fled and that she, she was tired of this abuse. And neither she figured it was better for her to go somewhere where she could die than put up with all this junk going on in Abram and Sarah's house. So she goes into the Bible, says the wilderness. Now I'm doing the foundation here, so stay with me says that she ran into the wilderness. Now, the wilderness means the desert. She went to a dry place, a desolate place, an isolated 
place. A place where it was just her. Where nobody else was around. A place that, that there was no sustenance. A place where there was no water. A place where there was no life. She went to a dry, deserted, uninhabited place. Her pain, her grief, her, her feelings of neglect, her feelings of being overlooked drove her to a dry and lonely place of darkness. Have you ever had that happen to you? Something happened. Somebody didn't treat you right. Somebody said something about you. Somebody abused you in some way. And instead of and not knowing how to handle it, you were driven into a place of loneliness and isolation and darkness. You were driven into a wilderness of depression because you didn't see anywhere else to go. You knew God. You knew what was, you knew what He was able. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But you were driven into a desert all because somebody treated you wrong. That's where Hagar was. She was driven into the wilderness. Here she is wondering, pregnant, pregnant. With a child that she didn't ask for. Not say she didn't love it, but she didn't ask for this. She's in there and she's left. She's fled from Abram and Sarah knowing that I'm gone now. I don't have the money I used to have. I don't have the connections I used to have. It's just me. To say she was wondering if anybody cared for her was an understatement. You know that while she was walking in that desert, she was wondering, I wonder if they even notice that I'm gone. I wonder if they're even going to send somebody else out here to see if I'm alive. I wonder if they even care that I've left. She started wondering, does anybody see me? It doesn't say it, but I know. She was thinking, does God even see me? He says that he's this. He says that he's high and lifted up. And my, my, sir, my, my, my master told me that he's LL known, that he's the controller and he, he, he knows it all. He, he's told me he's El Shaddai. He, he's told me that he's Elohim, but does he really see me? He's so good, but why is this happening to me? You ever ask that question? He's a good God, but why is this happening to me? If he's so good, why, is I, why does it seem I attract nothing but bad? I'm preaching better than y'all are shouting this morning. Does anybody care? Does anybody see me? She's lonely, isolated, feels neglected, used, abused, overlooked, assuming that her life is over. And her and her unborn child are going to die in this wilderness and nobody's ever going to even care or notice. But in the midst of her loneliness, she had an encounter with God. Verse number seven says, oh, I love this. And the angel of the Lord found her. Listen to that again. The angel of the Lord found her. She's in a dry place. Oh, I feel my help coming on. Yeah. She's in a de deserted place. She's in a dark place. Wondering if anybody even knew where she was. And the angel of the Lord, believed to pre be the pre-incarnate Jesus, finds her. Now that word found does not mean, that, uh, uh, does not uh, bring about the image of searching for something, not knowing where it is. He's God. He knew where she was. That word found means he was pursuing her. Even though she was running into the wilderness, even though she was going into a dry place, as she was running, as she was going to a place, not knowing who cared about her, the angel of the Lord was pursuing her and searching her out. He was telling her, you cannot go anywhere that I cannot find you. I want to tell somebody today, I don't care what kind of dry place you're in, you cannot go any place that God cannot find you. Psalm 139 says, if I ascend into the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. Even the darkness is light about me because God is everywhere. He knows where you are. He doesn't He can find you in bondage. He can find you in sickness. He can find you in every situation you're in. He can find you in a jailhouse. He can 
the angel of the Lord found her. He found her. Proving that there was somebody who knew that she existed. Proving that she was more important than what she thought. She had to be important for God to search her out. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know, I don't care what your mama told you. I don't care what your boss told you. I don't care what your, what your, what your spouse told you or what your ex-friend told you. You are more important. You are designed by God. You have a plan. He has a destiny for your life. God knows you. He knows where you are. And you are more important than you think. Amen. Amen. When he found her, he confronts her with a question. Don't you love when God asks you the question? He said, where are you going and where are you? Or where did you come from and where are you going? Now, remember, this is God. He knew where she had come from. He knew where she was going. The better translation of those two phrases were, what are you doing here? Hey, God, what are you doing in this building? Knowing who you know, knowing what you've heard, what are you doing here? Somebody in here, God is asking that question now, what are you doing in this building? What are you doing going back to that same pattern I've delivered you out of time and time again? What are you doing going back into depression, anxiety, and worry? What are you doing going to this wilderness knowing there's nothing there that can fix what you're going through? What are you doing here knowing who you know? You know me. What are you doing here? He says, what are you doing here? And she answers, like he didn't already know. I'm running from Sarah. I've done this. And he tells her, I want you to go back. Hold on. You mean to tell me? You're going to send me back to the place where I was abused, neglected, overlooked, unappreciated, unloved, and used like a product. Can you imagine her anxiety, the fear of knowing that she's got to look at Sarah, who she just ran from, of knowing she's got to face whatever consequences she's going to have to face for being a runaway slave. Imagine that thing. But the angel of the Lord, instead of just telling her to go back and leaving her, gives her something to hold on to. He said, you are with child, and I will bless your child and give you descendants. They'll be more. Gave her the same promise almost that God had given Abraham, because it was Abraham's seed. While it wasn't God's promised child, it was still Abraham's seed, and God has to see to his promise. He promised Abram he blessed his seed. And even though Hagar wasn't in part of the plan originally, he had to bless the seed. Amen. I'll bless you, and he will, be, he will be a wild man. All this stuff, we read it. So instead of sending her back, wondering what's going to happen, wondering what's going to look like, he didn't give her the whole plan, but he gave her a promise to hold to. Hear me. He didn't send her back, Brother Eddie, as anxious and as fearful and as depressed as what she left. He sent her back with the reassurance that I may be overlooked here, I may not be appreciated here, and I may not even feel like I am seen here, but I've got a promise from God. I'm, this may be a problem. This may be an issue. I may not exactly know how I'm going to handle it, but God has given me a promise. Ladies and gentlemen, I know I've told you before, but I've got to stop right here and tell you, it doesn't matter what situation you've got, what problem you're facing, God's got a promise for it. It don't matter what kind of wilderness you're in, God has a word for you. You may be in a wilderness of sickness, but Isaiah 53 and 5, by his stripes, we are healed. You may be in a wilderness of bondage, but Psalms 34 tells us that the Lord hears our cries and delivers us of all our afflictions. You may be brokenhearted and lonely, but the word tells us he's near to the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. You may feel like nobody knows you, nobody loves you, and everybody's deserted you, that your family don't even love you, but Psalm 27 and 10 says, though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will accept me in. I want to tell somebody today, it don't matter what you've got going on, your problem is not too big for his promise, and his promise is yes and amen. He has a promise for your wilderness, and I want to just go ahead and tell somebody, this wilderness is not your destiny. 
destiny. This valley is not the end result. This is just part of your journey. But when you come out of it, you're going to come out of it with more of a revelation of God and knowing Him more and understanding your God is able. I wish somebody did some praise for gave her a promise to hold to so that when times got tough, she could remember thus says the word of the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, we're all going to go through problems. Jesus said it's impossible that problems did not come. But he said even though, even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I am with you. My rod and my staff, they comfort you. He prepared the table before you in the presence of your enemies. He said, you may endure hardship, but my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, but my peace, which is not able to be comprehended by your mind. He promised you that even though you walk through these problems, he will deliver you out of them all. Amen. You've got a promise today. Lord, help me. Why I wear these every Sunday, I don't know. They look good. It's the dramatic effect. He tells her, go back, but here's a promise. And as she's having this revelation of God, it goes on to say, basically, because she, she named a whale. Now, if you don't know this, naming a whale is a sign of worship. What we sang earlier, you were worthy of it all. They would either build altars or they would dedicate a place to honor and worship God. Brother Jean, she had an experience with God. She had a revelation of who he was. And when she did, she got to worship him in the wilderness. She's, I don't know what she's saying, if she's saying. But I could imagine she'd say, you are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. She, she may have started singing. I want, it's my sermon. I preach the way I want to. And, and she may have started singing, you know, I just want to, all I want to do is love you. All I want to do is worship. She may have started saying, you're the way maker. You're the miracle worker. You're the promise keeper. She started worshiping in the wilderness. Ladies and gentlemen, if there's one thing we need to learn to start doing, is start worshiping in the wilderness. We need to learn how to worship even when we're in a dry place. We need to do what Paul and Silas did even when we're in prison in jail. They said at the midnight hour, they started singing praise and songs to God. And at the midnight, an earthquake happened and everybody's chains were loose. We need to start doing like the children of Israel. And when there's walls built up, when the enemy has put up a fortified city and we can't through. We need to remember that all we need to do is walk around and praise God and he'll break through our issues. I'm here to tell somebody today if you learn how to praise him even when you don't feel like it, even when you're hurting, even when you don't know what's going to happen, if you learn to give him praise, he will see to your situation. When you enter his presence with praise, he enters your circumstance with power. When we start praising God in the wilderness, God shows up and he starts changing things. My God Even though I don't know exactly what's going to happen, I'm going to worship you. Even though, Lord, I'm going through trial after trial and I don't understand the weight, God, I'm going to worship you because you are worthy and you are true to your word. She worshiped in the wilderness. Can you imagine how things would change if we'd start worshiping despite how we felt? Just like prayer should not be dependent on how you feel, neither should worship. She didn't feel like worshiping. She just got an encounter. So I'm sure she got a little bit of a she got a little bit of a, a, an encouragement, but still. Worship in the wilderness. She worshiped him. Because she had a revelation, Sister Nina. God revealed himself to her. And that's that, that was just my introduction. Because then that revelation shows us a new name for God. It says in verse 16, put it out for me, Brother David, if you can. I'm sorry, verse 13. If not, it's okay. 
Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, Have I also here seen him who sees me? You are the God who sees. Translated into the Hebrew, El Roy. E L R O I. El Roy. Combination name of El Elohim, the created God, the all powerful God. And the, and the word Roy, which means to see or to gaze. Now, this name reveals two really significant things about God. Now I'll, I'll tell them to you, and I'll get out of the way. First of all, it reveals the omnipotent nature of God. It shows that God really sees everything. Psalms 33 and 13 says that God sits in heaven and he sees all. Yeah. Job 24, and I think it's Job 48, 24, 24, 48. I have number dyslexia. Just find it. But it says that God sits and he sees all the sons of men. Second Chronicles 19 says that the Lord's eyes roam to and fro throughout the earth. I want to tell somebody, it doesn't matter what's happened to you, what people have done about you, and whether people believe or your situation or not. God saw what they did and he'll take care of it. Go ahead, give him grace for that. That's Because there's some of you that you know the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But it's hard, especially when you know what they're saying is a lie. Yeah. It's hard when you know they're tarnishing your character. Amen. It's hard when they know that, that, that there's things being said and things being done and that, that, you, that there's people against you. But I want to encourage you today that there's nothing that goes on from God, and if he sees it, he'll pay it. Reveals his omnipotent nature, but the second thing is, and this is what I love, it reveals his personal <coughs> and intimate nature. Verse 14, it says that she named the well Ber Roy, and in some of your Bibles, it'll give the translation which mine does. It says, the God who lives and sees me. Not just the God who sees, but the God who sees me. The God who even in the midst of it all sees me. The God who even though he spoke the heavens and the earth into creation and sits high, he knows the very numbers of hair on my head. The God who is more powerful and who is the most high, but yet he knit me together in my mother's womb and knows me better than I even know myself. It, it proves to us God sits high, but he looks low. He may be up the almighty God, the most high God, and he is omnipotent, and he is all powerful, but he is also personal. And he also had the power to see you even in the midst of it all. So he showed Hagar, I see you. I know where you're at. I see your problem. I see your situation. Even though you've been alone in this wilderness, and Abram and Sarah may not care one iota about you, I see you. El Roy, I see you. I need to let somebody know today, God sees you. Mm -hmm. I need to let somebody know today that God is El Roy and he sees you. Sister Myrtle, we all know you've walked through trials, you've walked through tribulations, and there's been times where we thought you would transition to glory before the rest of them. But you know what? Even in the midst of that, God saw you. Yeah. Yeah. Sister Tina, yeah. we've walked through loss. We've walked through the tides done going on. We've walked through many changes in life, job situations, lost a job. But even in the midst of it all, God yeah. saw you. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. We've wondered, where's my day? When's my ship coming in? Am I ever going to get called to the top? i got to have surgery. I don't make as much money as they do. Even though I live righteously, I go to the hotel and all the rest of them go out and live like fools. But El Roy, God sees you. I just, I just want to let somebody know that it don't matter what situation you're in today. You may not have any money. You may not have any friends. You may not have any companions. You may not have good health. But God sees you. He knows you. He cares for you. He is El Roy, and he sees all. And that means when that ball starts acting a fool and starts trying to get rid of you, El Roy, God 
child sees. Yeah. Sister Teresa, that means when those siblings and all that family issues start going on and you have to be, be the one to speak truth to their foolishness, God sees you. He knows what's going on. Sister Judy, when you go to those doctors and, and, and they go back yeah. and forth and they do all this stuff and you're thinking, and you're wondering up and down, up, God sees you. He knows where you are. Sister Anita, when those kids that you've been praying for, those grandkids yeah. you've been wanting to get saved, start acting more unsaved and more lost than ever, God sees you. He knows where you are. I want somebody to know today he is El Roy. He, he sees you even if you feel like nobody else does. Even if you feel forgotten. When you're going through fertility doctors wondering what's the next step, what are we going to do now? El Roy, he, when you're worried about your children, when you're out, what they're doing, how God's going to handle a school situation, El Roy, he, when you're worried about a job, about a companion, about a husband, El Roy, he, God sees you. I wish somebody, oh my God.
God sees me. I want to tell somebody today, just because you know God sees you don't mean your problems don't disappear. It does not mean that God's going to automatically fix it today. But what it does mean is that when you walk out of these double doors on either side and you face that problem tonight or you face it tomorrow, you can say, El Roy, that boss don't see me, but God sees me. That doctor don't see me, but God sees me. My children ain't talking to me and they don't see me, but God sees me. Nobody else may see me. Nobody else may care about me, but I got a God in heaven. I got a Savior who's King of the earth who sees me, who cares for me, who knows me, and who loves me, and who will work all things out for my good. El Roy, you need to implement that in your prayer life. Because there's a lot of unanswered prayers we've got. We're still praying for somebody to get saved. We're still praying for God to send in more people. We're still praying that God will heal all these people of sin. We're, we're still praying for a man in Birmingham, my dad, who every day the devil's trying to convince him that he's going to die. We're still praying. El Roy, God sees. This revelation is the one I'm almost done. This revelation gave Hagar the ability and the power to face that situation and go back to a place where she would feel unwanted, feel unloved, where she felt lonely. Gave her the strength because she knew I've got a promise and I've got a God who sees me. Yeah. Abram may not see me, Sarah may not see me, but God sees me. Yeah. And if God sees me, I must be important. Come on. If God searched me out when I wasn't even part of the original plan, but he still chased me in the wilderness and brought me back. I must be somebody to him. Amen. God sees me. And it don't matter who won't, who don't, or who can. God sees me. That's all I care about. What I want you to understand, and what I want you to grasp from this name, if you don't get another thing, out of this message, you just need to hold on to the fact he's El Roy. He is the God who sees, but he's also the God who sees you. Yes, he sees your problem, and yes, I promise you, <coughs> one way or another, he'll fix it. Because he desires to give good gifts to his children. But I think about it this way, and I know this. You've got about five more minutes. Yeah. I think about it this way. While they were thousands of years apart, I think, and I, I could see Hagar and the three Hebrew boys had the same encounter. You know the story. Nebuchadnezzar fowl or bird. And they go before the king, he brings them privately, he gives them a second chance. And he says, either you bow, or I'm going to kill you. And they said, they said, King, they said, King, we are not slow to answer you in this matter. We know that our God is able, and we believe that he will. Meaning, we know he's powerful. We know, he's, we know that he is omnipotent. We know he is almighty, and we know he can fix any situation. We know and we believe he's able, and we really believe that he can. But if not. But if not. Meaning, I've got a problem. I've got a situation. I know God can fix it, and I know he's got the power to fix it. But if not, if you don't do it the way I think he's going to do it, oh, if you don't do it on my timetable, if you don't fix it like I think he should, we still will not bow because God 